All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're coming to the next item, a lecture by Adam Harper, who um, teaches musicology at um, Oxford University, um, writes for The Wire, a couple of other publications, has a, I think it's a monthly column on The Fader, is it monthly? Yeah, about new music. Um, he has a blog, a fantastic music blog, Rouge's Foam, is it called? And Adam is one of the few people, um, one of the few music writers I know that still think there are like exciting things coming and going on <laughs> in modern music. And he's going to talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Henning. So yeah, my, my talk is about high tech as a new aesthetic, and it's really asking for trouble. Uh, I know that the technology somewhere along the line might, uh, might go on the fritz, but uh, um, I'm sure it'll be okay. Thank you very much for having me. It's lovely always to be in Berlin. Um, very exciting place um, for music in, in the world today. So the, the broadest question behind my talk today is, what is indie? Or, if you like, new underground popular music, um, what might be its essence? Is it uh, a mode of popular music production? Does it mean music making outside of the major commercial music industry or in its shallower waters? Uh, does it mean self-releasing? Um, does it mean DIY? Or is it more of a counterculture? Is it a community of music making opposed to mainstream tastes? Um, is it a protest? Is it a form of resistance? Or would it be better to describe it as a subculture, differentiable from mainstream culture and not especially related to it? Or is it merely an aesthetic, uh, an idea about what sounds good, uh, a style, a lifestyle even, uh, or just a look? Um, or is it all three? Can we conflate these three, this, the mode of production, the counterculture, and the aesthetic, and assume that they relate to each other and determine each other? I'm going to talk about high tech, uh, a pattern I've observed. Um, high tech is the name I give to it, um, emerging in underground popular music. It sheds some interesting light on these questions and might even suggest that indie's historical behavior as a mode of popular music production, as a countercultural impulse, and as a style uh, might be changing dramatically. High tech is in many ways the very opposite of the indie aesthetic we all know and quite possibly love. So why is this aesthetic changing so dramatically? Well, first of all, in many respects, indie is no longer doing what musicians and fans want or need it to do, some of them at least. This is from Portlandia. Um, it isn't representing um, what music fans w wanted to represent as a mode of popular music making, uh, as a counterculture, or as an aesthetic. Ever since the early 80s, it's been clear that the indie aesthetic is low tech. Now, that doesn't just mean low technology, although it, that's a very significant degree what it means. It also means low technique. Uh, indie music isn't about uh, really amazing guitar solos most of the time, uh, and it certainly isn't about using the, the very latest technology. In fact, lo-fi describes the recording style of so much indie, uh, and basically technologically and technically rough. And technology and technique, for me, combine in a phrase I like to call technocracy, which is a system in which power is given to those with technology and technical knowledge. And indie is a sort of low technocracy sort of a, an, an aesthetic. As a result, it's naive, primitivist, childlike, twee. Again, I'm not saying this is all independent music, but this is an indie um, aesthetic. Uh, twee, very much uh, uh, a term that's used quite a lot for it. Um, childlike, simple, that sort of thing. Archaic, by which I mean it recalls the past. It's some sort of recreation of the past. And that can be archaic technology, people going back and using analog synthesizers. It can be archaic styles, people um, singing and, and playing rock and roll like it was in the 50s again. And this is where we get the idea that the indie aesthetic is nostalgic from. And in terms of sort of mood, affect, it's benign. It's warm. Um, analog warmth. Uh, is a form of distortion. Um, people associate it positively with a kind of human quality. Um, indie aesthetics also kind of wise <clears throat> and kind of healthy. 
It's often associated with uh, healthy diets, organic food. And this whole Indian aesthetic, it, it's really actually very old. It goes all the way back to the, the folk revival. And people were saying these things about uh, as musical aesthetics um, back then in, in the 1950s even. <clears throat> and um, in many ways, the Indian aesthetic made sense as a consequence of its mode of production back in the 80s and even back in the 60s. It, necess it necessarily, independent music making was low technocracy. It involved uh, doing it yourself. It involved cassettes. Um, archaic music that, of the sort that Indian aesthetic favored was otherwise uncommon in the 20th century. So it had a novelty factor to be able to go back to the past and recreate that and evoke that. Um, and in fact, archaism was in many ways the cheapest option. The cheapest records were the records from the past. The cheapest technology was the technology from the past. The cheapest clothes uh, were those in charity shops uh, secondhand. Overall, Indian aesthetic was a necessity um, coming from its mode of production. And it also had, as a result, a countercultural effect. It was anti slickness, it was anti technological power, anti technocracy, uh, anti narrow standards of quality. And it was a kind of a protest form. And of course, punk is known in, in that sense if you take a wider definition of punk to include indie. Now, today, these uh, necessities and effects of the indie aesthetic are rapidly disappearing. The indie aesthetic is no longer a necessity. It's no longer a natural consequence of its mode of production. And we can't even pretend it is anymore. It is now more difficult and more expensive to find and use even low-tech analog equipment than to use the phones and laptops that a majority of people in the developed world have access to. Uh, Lo-fi is no longer the path of least resistance, but has to be um, a special and, and rather expensive performance. It's an affectation. You have to go out of your way to sound lo-fi, really. Um, indie music or alternative music is a small and successful international industry that frequently enjoys corporate sponsorship. It's, it's, it's no longer uh, a result of, of a mode of production that necessitates you know, rough, rough and ready DIY self-releasing. It's now several steps removed from the self-releasing impulse that gave birth to it in the late 20th centuries. Uh, mo the most famous indie music and a lot of the music that, that, that we know is, is, is sounding like indie is recorded in a studio, which wasn't the case in the 80s really a lot of the time. Um, nowadays, self-releasing occurs elsewhere, as I'll go into on Bandcamp and SoundCloud, and it receives uh, relatively little attention from even the underground uh, music press. And because of the growth of the indie aesthetic, prices have gone up uh, uh, of records, of technology and clothes. You can still buy secondhand clothes, uh, but getting the right vintage look uh, can be quite expensive. Um, and high-tech music technology, conversely, is more within reach than ever before. Uh, the chances are, if you're a teenager who wants to make music in the West, in the developed West, uh, you can perhaps illegally download uh, Ableton Live, I'm not condoning that, uh, or something like that uh, onto a laptop that you already have. So the indie aesthetic is no longer necessary, but it's also no longer new. Well, of course, uh, since it's archaic, it has an archaic factor to it, it was never really new per se, but its archaism was at least, as I said, novel and effective at the time. But now it isn't anymore. Uh, we are saturated now with retroism, with the sense that at, at best music can and should evoke the past, at worst, that all the possibilities, inventions and pleasures of pop music have already been discovered and that we can and should merely recycle them over and over again. Most famously, uh, it was Simon Reynolds who described this idea in his book Retromania in 2010. And uh, really since then I'm, I'm amazed that musicians and fans still feel it's, it's a good thing to, to, to recreate the past so faithfully um, and so diligently. Um, it's not just old, uh, it's oldness is old. Uh, it's doubly old, it's old squared. So <laughs> I, I prefer new things and, and, and high tech is, is in that bag, I think. The indie aesthetic is no longer new also in the sense that it's no longer the secret community of young people. Uh, the indie aesthetic can regularly be found at the top of the charts in Western countries. Coldplay, Mumford & Sons, MGMT. Worse than that, um, it's everywhere else too. It's on TV. It's in the way most cafes are designed. It's in high street clothing um, uh, for many fans. Everybody knows what a hipster 
looks like today. Uh, and routinely, and it gets very, very boring, people criticize them, know what they look like. It's just not fun anymore for anybody. Um, the origin of the term in indie circles was an archaic affectation. It was the 80s going back to the 1950s. Um, you know, so it, that's, that's not new either. And worse still, indie has blended, especially in my country, in the UK, with the forces of power and conservatism. Uh, you can tell when a neighborhood is being gentrified and the rents are about to go up because the indie aesthetic arrives. Um, and in the UK, uh, unfortunately, the Conservative Party, not typically um, uh, the, the favorite party of underground music in the UK, um, it used a sort of retro twee uh, uh, poster campaign in the, in the 2010 election. Um, and it fit, fitted with their sort of old-fashioned agenda. So after decades, Indy has won. And it is the aesthetic of the establishment. It's the aesthetic of the powerful. And opinion pieces are even talking about things like cupcake fascism. Um, you can Google that term. So and it's no longer sufficient for, um, for that. It's no longer a form of resistance. So you can see why people, especially younger musicians and fans, might be rejecting the indie aesthetic. And not just rejecting it, but doing precisely the opposite. Um, that's what high tech is, precisely the opposite of the indie aesthetic. Um, and it's just like what Indy was doing in the late 20th century, being the precise of opposite of the mainstream at the time. If the Indy aesthetic is about analog warmth, the high-tech aesthetic is about digital coldness. If the Indy aesthetic is about cozy nostalgia, high-tech is about harsh visions of the future. If Indy aesthetic is about rough, lo-fi sounds, organic sounds, high-tech is about glossy, metallic, HD, cybernetic sounds, if the indie aesthetic is about naivety and primitivism, high-tech aesthetic is about complex, technologically enhanced uh, sounds, war-ready sounds. I, I mean that as an opposite of naive, like a paranoid sort of um, being prepared for, for conflict and, uh, and trauma. If the indie aesthetic is wise, healthy, and friendly, the high-tech aesthetic is decadent, excessive, uh, almost aggressive. High-tech also seems much more true and relevant to the modern world, um, uh, it seems, uh, to, the, to the frightening and, and rapidly changing qualities uh, of the world that we find ourselves in than the indie aesthetic does. And, and this is what I wrote in the article Cold Forecast for Electronic Beats in January, which looked at many aspects of high tech. The comfortable, optimistic world of the turn of the millennium is now a bittersweet memory. Since then, a new technological sublime has emerged that has been seen as radically liberating and radically oppressive. The post-Cold War global political landscape has all but collapsed, in much of its legitimacy at least, and climate disasters are increasingly common with future ecological catastrophe a very real probability. The latter scenario in particular is creating an international atmosphere of human-engineered apocalypse, not unlike the mid-20th century threat of mutually ensured destruction, arguably worse but an encroaching new normal of automated technological tracking, surveillance, and ultimately drone strikes is catching up fast in the dystopia stakes. Um, a bit grim, that. But uh, this is the world that high tech lives in and, and certainly doesn't, doesn't see um, the indie aesthetic as, as legitimate in. Um, I think high tech music engages with the frightening qualities of this world and explores it in a kind of auditory science, science fiction. Really, it's a kind of 21st century futurism. There's also discussion of the word accelerationism, which is a sort of a, both a, a political philosophy and a, a, perhaps an aesthetic philosophy whereby the, the only real form of revolution is to drive the, um, uh, the, the negative qualities of the current regime to their, their ultimate dissolution. So rather than protesting capitalism, um, you'd become more capitalist than the capitalists. And, and I think you, you can see not necessarily that tactic, but a certain kind of pop art sarcasm in, in high tech music. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself whether this high tech is anything new or significant at all. There has been high tech music and auditory science fiction for decades. Techno, for example, hello, we're in Germany. Uh, IDM, drum and bass, industrial, all very, very similar to this high tech uh, thing. And, but here's why I think high tech is significant uh, in this case, especially um, today. It actually grows out, number one, it actually grows out of the indie aesthetic. And we'll, we'll sort of see how. Many of the producers, uh, musicians, artists, and fans, myself included, started in a more 
traditionally indie place aesthetically. Um, it has a similar audience, high tech has a similar audience and a similar press, most notably Pitchfork are writing about the artists I'm gonna talk about. And really I think I've experienced a migration of people from indie bands, indie rock bands, to uh, dance music, electronic music producers, um, especially after dubstep, um, grime, that sort of thing. There seems to be a demographic of people that are changing to a more high-tech style of music. Um, secondly, it has a conceptual dimension that other forms of electronics music don't have. This music isn't just pure sound, absolute music. Um, it illustrates things and has a clear multimedia aesthetic. Um, in fact, much of this music is, is related to the art community. Kim Lochten is one of the artists who um, really provides the visual language for high tech uh, and does a lot of flyers um, for various nights and, and record labels. Thirdly, high tech stands out in a context of retromania, um, especially because even electronic music has become lo-fi and retro lately. Lots of electronica is using analog equipment to suggest the past, just as indie did in the 1980s. And in many, many circles, slick electronic music is no longer considered um, fashionable um, or, or new. So even the electronic music, much of it at least, has become indie in a way. Um, and so that's, that's why high tech is necessary, I think. So let's have a look at some of the musicians involved, some more famous than others. Um, there are plenty of uh, artists who are sort of semi-high-tech, which I won't go into. Uh, people like Grimes, Glasser, Autranova, Gazelle Twin, lots of dance and electronica that I don't need to go into. Um, people who use computers, but are not necessarily within a kind of high-tech aesthetic to the extent that I'm looking at. Um, I'm going to look at some of the, the clearest examples first. You may have heard of One Oak Tricks Point Never. Uh, Daniel Nopatin, NYC-based artist, uh, who started in the late noughties, or started getting attention in the late noughties, uh, with a kind of synthesizer minimalism evocative of the 70s and the 80s. But un unlike other artists, um, kept things sonically hi-fi, um, and uh, a mix of, uh, it is, is therefore a mix of archaic and high-tech that opened the door to a more up-to-date futurism, I think. Uh, yeah, this is the track Russian Mind. So high tech, but the high tech of the 70s and the 80s and the 60s, but still hi-fi. And with his album R Plus 7 last year, um, it had become clear that OPN was now one of the most prominent emerging artists in indie. It was one of the albums of the year for most places. And R Plus 7 featured a disorienting mix of high technology, past and present, sounding like something generated by an artificial intelligence. Uh, R plus seven more high tech. So this is the track Inside World. Very strange album, very kind of avant-garde album, but loads and loads of people listened to it and liked it. It, it, was, it was no longer a sort of niche concern. Laurel Halo, another major figure here, whose success in indie circles is even more surprising perhaps, as she's in many cases even more experimental, um, mixing techno and noise outside of dance functionality altogether. Um, however, again, she's one of the most prominent artists, uh, prominent names um, in end of year best album lists. And not just because of long-term Electronica fans. Um, it's, it's odd, you know, Laurel Halo is, is basically a techno producer, but it's, it seems to be indie fans, or if you can still call them indie fans, that listen to her. She's in a different context to, you know, most, most techno producers. Um, and she's based in NYC. Quarantine in 2012 was a very popular. Chance of Rain last year, uh, another fantastic album. And this is her track, Carcass. She sang on the album Quarantine, and, and so this is her singing. My carcass, my carcass, she sings. 
um, not very twee. Um, uh, James Ferraro, really one of my favorite artists at the moment, so I think uh, one of the most interesting artists working today. He first came to the attention of the underground um, as a lo-fi artist based in the US. Um, as a lo-fi artist, not unlike a more experimental version of Ariel Pink, Hypnagogic Pop was the name Wire Magazine gave to the sort of music that he was doing, a kind of very lo-fi, noisy uh, look at the 80s. So very much archaic, low-tech um, originally. Um, but quite suddenly in 2011, he took his pop art pastiche um, to the present day with Far Side Virtual, a fantastic and fantastically controversial uh, record. Um, Why well, Magazine made it the album of the year and then sort of kind of half apologized for it online afterwards, saying that the voting um, technique was very complicated and, and really they didn't necessarily want to have produced, uh, put an, an album of Muzak. On, on there, but that's what it was, um, a sarcastic but, uh, but wonder-filled portrait of the mediascape of recent memory, uh, filled with chirping ringtone style hooks. Um, and so this is Global Lunch from Far Side Virtual. You might have heard the Skype sound in there somewhere, in the, and uh, I'm afraid from, from here it kind of gets worse, so uh, <laughs> we'll see. But anyway, since then, Ferraro has become one of the most prom prominent practitioners of the high-tech aesthetic, moving on from pop art pastiche to cybernetic forms of beats and R&B on albums like Inhale, C4 Dollars, uh, Sushi, it's all silica gel, Sushi, Cold, NYC Hell, 3 AM, lovely very, very uh, dark record. Um, Suki Girls was a collection of beats from earlier on. As you can see from the image, he's also taking a slightly more high-tech look sartorially these days. And um, this is a track from Silica Gel e-cig, because e-cigarettes are also kind of one of the accessories of choice for the high-tech crowd. Arca and FKA Twigs, um, very much names of the moment, joined together on uh, EP2 in 2013. Uh, really fantastic EP. Um, production by Arca, um, song by FKA Twigs. Um, uh, these two artists may bring high tech to even further audiences. Certainly FKA Twigs' album has been very well received lately. Um, and it's got very, very strange and alienating textures, certainly EP2 has. In particular, the, the visual and vid video work of Jesse Kander has provided a multimedia context uh, for these two sounds. Bodies warping um, in, a, in a 3D rendered environment, certainly not a sort of hand-drawn thing. Arca's and, 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 and mix was, uh, was wonderful as well. Um, and yeah, FKA Twigs this year, LP. Um, this is Pappy Pacify from EP2. So those are some of the artists, uh, very prominent ones. Let's look at some of the slightly less famous areas. Uh, high tech can also be thought of as a, as a collection, uh, a family of, of styles or genres. And at the top um, of the list is Vaporwave. Um, I've written about most of these, and you'll see the names of the articles I've written on, on these things, um, hopefully on the slides. Um, and uh, Vaporwave was one of the first of those, a really interesting genre that's emerged. It first started out um, as a bit of a micro-genre created by teenagers who were influenced by some of the pop art work of Daniel Lopatin, one actually point never, and James Ferraro. But now it's really become huge. Uh, if you, it's very, very Googleable um, nowadays. And um, it's got a Reddit page. 
uh, hundreds of albums on Bandcamp uh, and, uh, and SoundCloud if you search the tag Vaporwave. And uh, it mostly consists of loops of corporate mood music, as I like to call it, and silky adult contemporary pop, also includes some disco as well. Um, so it's been uh, very, very simple, uh, Vaporwave. Um, it's, uh, it's midway between production and DJing. A lot of people are sort of ethically... Uh, uh, you know, negative towards Vaporwave because it really is just taking bits of Muzak um, and, and looping them. It's, uh, it's very, very minimal, very simple. So in many ways, it's low-tech um, as well as high-tech since it's very easy to make, um, although sometimes it's composed from scratch. There are some artists who do that. Um, but it very much um, connotes uh, the high-tech late 20th century and, and even the present, focusing on um, very technically and technologically sophisticated musics um, E-pianos, um, keyboards, um, FX7, uh, FM synthesizers rather. Um, and to that effect, it has a very active uh, visual and textual dimension with artists' names and track titles, often long strings of Unicode and um, enigmatic, at least to most Westerners, um, Asian East Asian characters. It's tempting to write Vaporwave off as just a kind of musical prank, um, but for the musicians and fans, it's much more than that. It's it can be a really ambivalent, tragicomic, even beautiful uh, genre with a, with a real utopian romanticism. And um, perhaps you have to be a certain age to sort of really read uh, that utopian ra romanticism rather than the annoying qualities. But um, I first heard it as a kind of a, an art prank. Um, but the more I listen to it, the more I, I fall in love with it. And I was, I was listening to Vaporwave in the airport as I was coming here. And it's, it's the perfect accompaniment for an airport, really. Um, yeah, because it has a history of, with, as ambient music as well. So here are the names of some of these Vaporwave artists. New Dreams Limited, Internet Club, Infinity Frequencies, Luxury Elite, Gujade, Skeleton, Company Auto, Telepath, uh, and Eyeliner. Uh, and some of the labels, you can see from the names, uh, it's very corporate mood music. Fortune 500, Business Casual 87, Dream Catalog, Illuminated Paths, and Eyelanthus. Uh, and this is a track by Telepath called Lost Love. And as you can see, it's a, a very strange, um, interesting looking um, bit of text. I think this artist is American, so. Thank you for flying with us. Um, High-tech beats. Um, so beats and beat making of a sort of broad hip-hop variety really is the garage punk of the 2010s, I think. Uh, and Bandcamp and SoundCloud are full of electronic hip-hop beats, which often come under the high-tech aesthetic. In particular, uh, the effect of, of so-called trap production um, is high-tech with its very regular robotic drum machine sounds. You, you'll know it when you hear it. Um, it sounds like a lot of things. It sounds like a money counting machine. Um, it sounds like a sort of robotic hummingbird, but it also sounds like a taser. There's sort of um, a very interesting kind of uh, hi-hat percussion effect. Um, uh, James Forero is a leader here, but there are plenty of other emerging artists in areas I've variously called indigo beats. Um, that was my, my vote for new genre, but <laughs> it's a bit of a weird one. Um, and platinum beats. Um, platinum beats have a, have a cold, metallic sound. Um, again, grim, um, high-tech, uh, sort of dark. Some of the artists involved here, Contact Lens, Blank Banshee, very popular album called Blank Banshee 1. Um, thousands of people on Bandcamp listened to it, and only one blog covered it. Um, Suberis, um, UK producer, very interesting. Sentinel. Dainu and Bine, and yep, that's a little picture of a snowman in the name of that artist. This is uh, Poolside by Suberius. That sort of thing is, is really what I think of when I, when I think of, of high-tech aesthetic, what I'm talking about, this very kind of, it sounds like you're in the mind of a, of a robot um, as, as you listen. 
Hardcore pastiche, this is one of my favorites, but um, nobody else really seems to get it. Um, now there's um, often been an element of uh, archaic pastiche to indie, um, but a handful of really interesting recent artists have gone even further than James Ferraro did on Farside Virtual in recreating very diligently and in very high detail, high tech, high pop music. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I find this stuff really interesting. The, 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 uh, the impulse to create this stuff I find very fascinating. So we've got Gatekeeper, ADR, who's in Gatekeeper, HD Boys, Yen Tech. And there's a certain degree of overlap with new composed Vaporwave, indeed, um, because people do write Vaporwave this wave as, uh, as well. Prism Core Virtual Enterprises, Eyeliner. Um, that's the article. Uh, and this is Exolift by Gatekeeper. And this is for, this, as you listen to this, this is for kind of arty underground music fans. This is why I'm saying that it's really the context that makes high-tech high-tech. I mean, thousands and thousands of people are listen to, listening to that sort of music, but in this case, um, this sort of music is, is performed at sort of art shows at uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York, and uh, it, it, it goes to a different audience, and, and you get sort of interesting mix-ups. Um, Pitchfork reviewed ADR's album, um, uh, Chunky Monkey, um, uh, as if it was just another sort of Chemical Brothers-style album, when really it was, it was a sort of arty, postmodern pastiche, so uh, which a huge amount of effort and talent had gone into. So very interesting, I think. Cuteness. Now, lest you thought that high tech was only macho and grim, um, cuteness has been one of the major trends in the underground in the past year. And what makes it high tech is the speed, imagery, and of course the technology. This is very different from twee. Um, it's lurid and decadent, digital, artificial, glossy, uh, and in the UK, you've got um, Sophie, uh, the PC music label, which everybody seems to be talking about at the moment. Felicita does it in a more, in a more experimental style. And Cutie, which uh, is Sophie and A.G. Cook, who's running the PC music label together. Um, and uh, in the US, um, DVI, people like DVI, May She Smile, the Zoom Lens label, Magic Yumi Records. And there's a huge influence of, uh, of anime, J-pop, Nightcore, Vocaloids. If you've seen Neon Genesis Evangelion, uh, the, the anime series, that's a huge reference point amongst these communities um, who are enjoying this sort of stuff. Nightcore uh, is a sort of music that's been around for about a decade. Uh, it's sort of sped up um, uh, hard hardcore music, sped up trance, and uh, in fact, um, sort of these helium voices are all the way through cuteness, sounding both like a sort of hyper-feminine voice and a sort of, basically, a Pokemon. Um, Vocaloids um, as a form of um, software synthesizer, vo uh, song synthesizer from Japan uh, are very popular as well, especially the imagery um, surrounding them. Uh, the article was called Pon Cuter Love, a twisted pun on computer love. Um, and this is the track Lip Gloss Twins uh, by Lip, Lip Gloss Twins called Wannabe. This stuff is, is hugely popular with younger listeners, and it really pisses off older listeners. Um, it's, it's some of the controversial, most controversial music um, uh, in, in, in sort of uh, pop, pop discourse, underground discourse at the moment. Queer rap, you may well know of these artists already. A new school of US queer rappers tend to prefer cold, strange productions and imagery um, uh, to their, um, um, their, their straight counterparts, perhaps. Uh, Mickey Blanco, uh, Ellie one, Ellie, I always say Ellie1F, but I think it's Leif. Um, Zebra Cats, Cakes the Killer. Um, I wrote about them in Cold Forecast. Mickey Blanco, this is a Mickey Blanco track produced by a very interesting producer, Amnesia Scanner. Um, very uh, strange, alienating, sort of um, very different sound.
It's about as far from a sort of warm soul sample as you can get this, you know, um, stuttering metallic sound. Very exciting, I think. Um, a few more experimental varieties, if that's what you're into. High-tech noise, um, mostly centered in London. Artists like Broodmar, Yearning Crew, LXV, Rexand, uh, in the article, London's high-tech noise. Um, it's, it's analog noise. Uh, well, it's not analog noise. Um, a lot of no noise musicians are still uh, using analog equipment and using a lot of hiss. Um, but these musicians are exploring digital gloss, um, and they're, they're quite happy to have their music as a download. Um, this is Broodmar's Not Going Home in Flesh. Epic Collage. It's sort of got the name because people use the word epic and the word collage a lot, and I sort of put it together. Um, this is some of my favorite stuff around at the moment. Surreal mixtures of pop and, and, and high-def sound effects. Um, e plus E, Diamond Black Hearted Boy, Total Freedom, TCF. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very strange, very provocative stuff. This is a, uh, a Diamond Black Hearted Boy track, I Don't Need Protection, You. Cool, so sort of to finish up, let's turn back to this idea of India as a mode of production, um, independent from major music industry. Um, Indie has gone high tech in this sense too, in that most of the music I've talked about today, and loads and loads more, is digitally distributed online, often for free. The more experimental it is, the more for free it tends to be, I find. Um, in a way, the high tech aesthetic is something of a consequence of its high tech mode of production. High tech is the digital world listening to itself, uh, the internet looking in the mirror, um, representing itself, understanding itself. But of course, not all music in the online underground is self-referential and conceptual. That's why I prefer the term online underground to the term internet music, which seems to imply that the music's about the internet, doesn't have to be. Really, high tech is the aesthetic crest of a new wave of indie underground music fans whose culture is almost entirely based online. These are people in their late teens, early 20s. This music is... Um, uh, uh, uploaded onto, no, he's networked on Facebook and uploaded onto um, Bandcamp and SoundCloud. Record labels um, still provide an aesthetic and communal focus for this, these scenes, um, but often the people who run them and the artists on them haven't even met each other. Um, this new generation doesn't even have the beginning uh, beginnings of a nostalgia for analog indie or, or any belief in its inherent authenticity. They even congregate around live streaming gigs, most famously SPF 420, um, a, um, a, 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 a tiny chat streaming platform which uh, used to host Vaporwave events and now has hundreds and hundreds of fans who rock up, really, really like it, and don't seem to have too many people writing about their scene. So let's return again to these three terms at the start of the talk. Um, high tech is a new mode of production for the self-releasing underground. And it is situated in the very same digital world it engages with aesthetically and critically. High tech is a new countercultural position, a form of resistance to the power of the indie aesthetic itself, as well as a form of critique or engagement with capitalist musics. I described it once as lo-fi going on the offensive rather than dis um, uh, generating the other of, of, of corporate music. It's becoming that and uh, reclaiming that. And high tech is the aesthetic that embodies this position. You might say that it's a replacement of the indie aesthetic, but I would say that it is the indie aesthetic itself, or what it should be in 2014. It is the new confluence of countercultural ideology, novelty, and technological necessity. Thank you very much. Yeah, so if someone has a question to add him or remark or anything, it's the time for that is now. Okay. Hi. I will try to. 
Uh, hey there, thanks. <coughs> My name is Matt. I'm a journalist as well for Vice and CDM. Um, I'm curious where you think that Asia fits in all of this as a culture that has always kind of had an intimate connection to the machine um, and has had in some ways major and indie is crossed in weird ways. How does that play into kind of the stuff yeah. you're talking about in 2014? Well, Asia, you know, certainly has become a trope in this stuff. For the f in the Western imagination, um, it, it does um, represent the future, uh, high tech, sort of post post human aspects, and it, it comes back again and again. Vaporwave very much looks towards. Um, uh, you know, a kind of a romanticized Asia and uh, uses a, a plenty of, of, of these a East Asian characters, probably without being able to speak the languages. Um, Fatima al Qadiri is a name I didn't mention, but certainly very much a, a, a high-tech um, player has recently released the album Asiatish, which is sort of as a kind of high-tech China of the, of the imagination. Um, and as I say, this kind of cuteness um, um, strand comes from Kawaii, uh, being being sort of the Hello Kitty Pokemon Japanese variety of um, are, are of the same, and uh, actually Asians themselves seem to be really getting involved in this aesthetic. They seem to understand it. Um, lots and lots of vaporwave artists seem to be Japanese. Now a lot of people would put Japan as where they come from on their Bandcamp page just to be mysterious, but I, but I think a lot of um, Japanese uh, people. Um, are, 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 are sort of tuned into this aesthetic. One of my favorite Tumblr blogs at the moment for new music, which I, I really owe a massive shout out, um, is Hi Hi Whoopee. And I, um, I'm always putting that blog into Google Translate because it's Japanese. Um, but it, I discovered lots of the music um, that I love um, through them. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, it, it really is, for Western, as a kind of romanticism. You know, for all that indie is a sort of twee romanticism, this is just as, as romantic, really, and it's just as involved in tropes uh, and stuff. So there is a certain degree of exoticism around, um, around this sort of thing, um, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable as a kind of critical musicologist type person. Um, and it's also not just Asia, but um, the Arab world um, that, is, that is often the focus of this stuff. Um, you know, people are putting Arabic characters in, people are using what they believe to be Arabic scales on synthesizers. Dubai is, is very much in the, in the contemporary imagination at the moment. <clears throat> and I'm afraid I've seen the word desert wave uh, uh, for, as a name for a genre, but uh, I, I'll never mention that again. Um, again, so, so people are definitely going global with, with um, their sense of, of the future. And you know, as, as the future arrives, countries get closer and closer together and, and some countries seem seem to loom, loom larger, or parts of the world seem to loom larger in, in that image of the future than others, and Asia, Asia is certainly one of them. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Hello, um, I'm, I'm Alex Mayolo, and I write for a recording magazine called Tape Op. And, oh, um, right. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. And, and um, I'm interested in some of the, the more experimental stuff has a lot of I, I hear tape hiss and mm. things in it, and I'm wondering: is there any crossover between this and um, and the, the curious cassette tape revival thing? Or is there have these two genres yeah. crossed over? Well, well they do in a strange way. You'd, you'd think they wouldn't, but actually, um, you know, uh, as I sort of said, the high tech and indie aesthetic are not black and white. Uh, they, they, they do swing around from each other, but it's still a continuous line from one to the other. And, um, you know, Dainu's music, very high-tech, very abstract, is produced on cassette. And I don't actually think that the, the sort of the tape hiss is, is supposed to be part of the experience, but I, I don't imagine that they would deny it. Actually, it gets very, very interesting. I mean, I could, I could go on for ages about the, 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 the crossover between lo-fi and hi-fi, but the hiss sound... Um, is is the sound of gas escaping, and you'll notice that it's called uh, vaporwave. And the picture of, of James Farrow we had, he was sort of surrounded in dry ice, and there's e-cigarettes. For some reason, there's an, a fixation with um, a kind of uh, the vaporous, you know, fumes, um, imagery, and, and, and an aesthetic in there. And uh, one of the th one of the best ways in which you can demonstrate a, a hi-fi sound system is through high frequency noise. And you see, as a kind of reversal of lo-fi, you, you see people with these very twinkly, high frequency components in their sound. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, uh, people like James Farrow started off as the lowest of, of lo-fi. Um, I mean, I actually, I, I just completed, very nerdy, I just completed my PhD on the history of lo-fi aesthetics. 
And it's interesting because you, you, you sort of see an indie, an indie aesthetic of lo-fi where um, tape hiss and low-tech low, low is, 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 is part of the aesthetic. But then you, you see people, and you know, maybe a lot of them are the readers of, of, of tape op and, and magazines like that, op magazine, the original op magazine, um, for whom cassettes are just a means to an end. And there's, there's no necessarily lo-fi indie aesthetic agenda in there. And so they're producing electronic music without, you know, without an, any kind of uh, medium is the message element in there. Um, so yeah, but uh, that's a very interesting area, I think. Um, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I wanted to say the whole like, to, just to make an ad additional point, the whole tape labels just devoted to that kind of sound. Like yeah. I was thinking about 1080p yes. from Vancouver, and which is like one of the, I think most well-known labels for that aesthetic mm. um, right now. And they are like producing everything on tape. They, I mean, they, they also like release via Bandcamp, but yeah. so like they have this tape aesthetic. Uh, precisely, they're right on the cusp, aren't they, between sort of high tech and an indie aesthetic. The, the, the label is called 1080p, which is the name of the highest quality on, on YouTube, and yet the sort of the imagery is of a kind of late 80s lounge kind of look, and um, it, there's a lot of sort of mixtures of dance, um, dance styles and electronic styles. Um, so yeah, this kind of odd, ironic mixture of of, of high-tech and low-tech connotations. And also in Vaporwave as well, you see lots of albums where the, uh, the tracks are called like IMAX and Apple and iPad and they're all the very latest technology. But then you listen to them and they sound like, you know, some, some VHS aerobics cassette from 1986. And so I think there's, a, there's an interesting uh, gap in like in 1080p between the, the high-tech of today and, and the low-tech of yesterday. And I think what, what I like to sort of talk about is this idea of planned obsolescence and that um, uh, there is a sort of a promise in this music that it will go out of date very quickly. Um, and, you know, perhaps we'll, we'll listen to this stuff in 20 years' time and think, gosh, isn't the sound quality so, uh, so two-dimensional or something? You know, maybe we'll be listening massive surround sound and it'll be lo-fi again. Hi, my name Hi. is Daniel. I run a label called Blip Street, and we release a lot of music made with old school computers. We come from the old school demo scene as a computer underground oh, right, scene. Yeah. So I wonder what you think about the kids nowadays going back to older technologies like Game Boys or even Atari STs for MIDI or Amigas and all that. Mm. Well, again, yeah, that can go that can go two ways. I can imagine certainly people going to 8-bit, and you know, the, lots of indie music has become 8-bit. Um, for reasons of historicity and archaism and nostalgia and old technology. Um, but I think for, for the people in the demo scene, I think that's actually a subculture rather than you sort of a part of, of, of an indie countercultural aesthetic necessarily. Um, and I think for them, it, it, it is kind of a modernist, uh, perhaps, um, for some of them um, at least, uh, a modernist engagement with technology. And there is something very pure about those sounds um, in, in the demo scene and in, in 8-bit and, and the possibilities of those sounds, which is nothing um, nothing to do with kind of postmodern irony or distance or ca critique of capitalism or something. But you, again, you can see how, you know, sounds with a particular technological connotation can go both ways. On the one hand, you've got, um, you know, demo scene people like Vert who are, who are really um, great at what they do um, and really engaging with the technology. And then people like Crystal Castles for whom it's a kind of a part of a sort of naive uh, dance disco world. Um, so, so they do go either way. But uh, yeah, again, it's, it's not usually lumped in with lo-fi. Um, I prefer to think of, of, of that kind of engagement as, a, as a, uh, interested in the technology itself and its possibilities rather than the surface of the technology for countercultural critique purposes. But it will depend on what listeners are and practitioners are doing and what they're in it for. Hi Adam, um, thanks for the interesting uh, insights. My name is Thomas and I, I was wondering, um, you know, this all was been described as the sounds of the future and if I think of this future, I think it's, it's going to be silent. If you think of oh, right. mobiles, you know, cars, cars gonna be silent or right now they are designing sounds for how they sound like. Um, warfare is gonna be silent mm. and um, can you do you have like like ideas how all these musicians kind of interact with that 
part of the future which is about to come. Yeah, or? that's that's interesting. When, when you said the future is going to be silent, I thought you were going to say, you know, because the human race is going to die and the, the planet's <laughs> going to explode, <laughs> which might be a good reason for the future to be silent. Well, yeah, after the eventual heat death of the universe in, in 13 billion years, that, that'll be a profound silence. Um, but, um, well, firstly, I, I'm, I'm reminded of John Cage, who said that there was, there was no such thing as, a, as silence, really. And even when you're in an anechoic chamber where there's absolutely no echoes at all, you can still hear the sound of your, um, uh, your, your blood um, flow and your nervous system, a high and a low drone. Um, perhaps even that will be removed if we put our brains in, into computers. Um, but it's an interesting one. I think, I don't know about silence, perhaps silence will come into it, but subtlety, certainty, uh, certainly is something that, um, that I'm noticing. These people like Suberius and, and Diamond Black Hearted Boy, these tiny clicks, you know, the sound a computer makes, it's, not, it's a kind of computer silence, but really from a human point of view, it's, it's that, that sort of click. Remember that an old PC used to make? And you hear those kind of sounds. In fact, that's been, those sounds have been in glitch for, for a long, long time. But um, in, in high tech, that they come into it as well. It, you discover that actually there's a whole life of machines. And you don't know whether these are machines that people are using or machines that are operating automat auto automatively. Um, that's, I'll, I'll look out for silence. That's an, interesting, that's an interesting idea. Thanks. I think we've got time for just probably one more, maybe. This guy. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. Hi. It's really interesting. Um, I'm Laurie. I work at Electronic Beats as well. Just started this week. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm interested with this stuff uh, and how it relates to the live arena. It seem, uh, leading on from that question, it seems that it's very much to do with headphone listening, to do with mm. online forums, whatever. And um, personally, I kind of worry like what this does to the live experience or what the, the new live experience this stuff yeah. should and could entail. Yeah, really, really pertinent question. Um, and you're right, I mean, this stuff doesn't have a particularly live dimension. Um, and even if it did, it would probably be quite expensive to do, um, you know, with all this, this high-tech technology. Um, sort of blue light and artificial plants um, are kind of a fashionable um, sort of trope of high-tech. And I've been in clubs where, where people have put these artificial plants on the stage to make it look like a sort of biosphere type type environment. Um, but you're right, there, there is not a, not, not a lot live. It would probably be very difficult to do live. Um, live shows are, are strange. I mean, uh, James Ferraro does a sort of semi-sampled live performance. Um, and uh, <coughs> really, the, uh, it, the live music is where I think this will live live or die. Um, because uh, you're starting to see these, these online streaming platforms. I suppose Boiler Room being one for a much more sort of famous music, but um, SPF 420, these are a group of, of teenagers in, in the States who decided to start a, a party on Tiny Chat, which is basically just a, a webcam service, and it's very, very low quality. Um, but, um, and I didn't, didn't think anyone really would really want that kind of thing, but hundreds and hundreds of people are into SPF 420. They, they log on, uh, it crashes. And what it is, is, is a webcam, and they, they link people up in their bedrooms all over the world. And they perform directly into the, into the, into the, into the sound, uh, into the outs of the, of, the, uh, of the gig. And then meanwhile, there's a scrolling chat at the bottom, and everybody is um, everybody's talking and appreciating the gig. And somebody, um, one of the um, directors of the event, usually Liz, her name is, will say something like, say 420, and that's the sign for the whole crowd to then say 420, and suddenly the, the chat window turns into, like, everybody says 420. It's, it's a very interesting live event. Now, as you know, an older person raised on going to see indie bands, you do have a bit of a, of a feeling if it's actually, can it actually be as great an experience? Um, but th these people really, really love it, you know, against all expectations. And as quality improves and it becomes easier to, to hold these live streaming gigs, I think there will be a, a significant live um, event. The thing about Vaporwave as well is that it's, it's kind of obscure. I mean, nobody in your town is going to have heard of Vaporwave unless you're in, like, London, perhaps. But um, uh, uh, that's why sort of niche music survives better online, I think, than you know, down at your local youth club or, or something like that. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how the live, uh, live element um, develops. Um, 
I, I wanted to say that I think the visuals are just getting more important again. I, I remember seeing one of Tricks by Never at Berghain. Mm. Uh, it was basically an audiovisual experience. It was not like that much about like performing live the music, but it was more like there's a big screen and, and like really interesting visuals. And also like Jessica Kanda mm. making the visuals for, for Arca and for FKA Twigs. Mm. This is something that happens live, I think, more and more. When you when these people are forced to perform, I, sometimes I feel like. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, actually, with this stuff, there's an element of craft in it as well. It's it's you don't just click a button and a giant 3D environment appears. I'd say it was actually harder pr to produce these visuals and more of a craft um, than than it is to do sort of hand draw a kind of stick figure, um, or, or you know, in the in the sort of perhaps in the indie style, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so in, in the sense of people working hard on an object, that, I don't think that's, uh, that element has been lost. So I think that's probably it. Any further questions further or comments? Questions? Um, otherwise, I think we are done. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Adam. Thank